Hey everybody, happy Halloween. And this is the first episode of Engineering the Paranormal. I am Rob Walzak of Ghost Gear. Uh, so the idea of this podcast is to just get out and talk about the technical devices that are used in the paranormal. Um, I, I want to talk about them in a sense that, uh, you know, describes how they work and how they should be used out in the paranormal because I see a lot of folks that don't know any better. I mean, no fault of their own, but they're not using the devices properly and they're getting a lot of false positives. So hopefully this podcast will be aimed to you know, fix that issue. Uh, future podcasts will be live, so I plan on taking questions from the audience and answering those questions live about uh, you know anything you have uh, about devices and, and the technical aspect of them. Uh, the, the first one, this is a pilot, uh, you know, podcast. So I'm just doing this to see what the responses are like. First of all, what it what it looks like if uh, if it's something I should move forward with, and uh, you know just give it a shot. Um, so today, what I want to talk about on our first episode on Halloween, Happy Halloween again, uh, is about the Murpos device. Most people out there have probably never heard of the Murpos device. Okay, what it is, it is a data logger. It was invented by Jim Sigala. Uh, you may have uh, seen him on the Skinwalker Ranch. He holds several PhDs. He is a physicist, and he's one of the few physicists that we have in the paranormal that partially believes you know, to the sense that he will uh, research it and gather data for it. Um, so he has uh, invented this data logger called the MARPAS, M-U-R-P-A-S, and you can buy them. They're very expensive, so they'll set you back almost a thousand bucks to get all of the little widgets that you can uh, attach to it. Uh, it's a fantastic device, though. You, so essentially what it does is it's a data logger, environmental data logger that data logs everything that uh, you could think of that entities, whether they be otherworldly entities or interdimensional beings could affect even, uh, it even data logs gamma radiation, which I think is pretty dang cool because what he's finding is gamma radiation does correlate with paranormal activity, uh, which is dangerous. Gamma radiation is bad for living beings. Uh, you know, it, it'll break the, the cells down. It's, it's uh, ionizing radiation is what it is. Uh, so, what what it does is it data logs everything from you know the, the normal stuff emf radio frequencies all that stuff all the way up to gravitational pull it'll even data log what the gravity is like at that moment uh and, and all the way up to the gamma rays like i said and it will send all this data up to his uh to his server and you can go and look at your data it you know it's like a data logger so you can look at all the different data and if you upload to your account any kind of instances that you have experienced anything that, that's strange uh, he and his team will go back and look at your data and they will find some anomalies if there are any uh, that correlate with your experiences uh, so let's take a look at this this video here. This was a podcast where he was a guest on, on a video, and he explains it a little better than I do. Yeah. But you you saw your waveforms, how flat and normal they look. I mean, here's the, oh, in fact, this is this would be a normal waveform, right? Very very flat, nothing crazy going on. But then all of a sudden, you know, at some point, then you get these enormous spikes come along, and you can't. These are not something you can create in your house by yourself. These are things that have to be created somehow outside of your house. And you're just reacting to these signals. And then when those signals happen is when this strange stuff starts happening to people. And just as an example, um, this is one. I just want to show you this particular one. This is something that this is one of my favorite so this is a very so if you look at the, to over here in this area this is the microwave very very flat nothing crazy go on all of a sudden this is what happened in that particular i think it was like a two hour period or something like that and then gamma was very very normal very very normal and all of a sudden they had this incredible uh 
the flurry of gamma particles come in at the same time that microwave. And at that exact, and this person, of course, didn't even know that, never even saw this data, never actually looked at this data. This is something that I wasn't even giving this person real time data. Um, in the morning, they got up and they entered into this. I'm telling you, last night was such a crazy night. If I were to ever say I was abducted, it would be last night. It was such a strange experience. This is a person that is by far the most rational person I ever met, never had any kind of problems or any experiences or anything like this. And then that one night, um, this happened. And ever since then, there's been multiple experiences that happen after that. So. This is kind of what the, the whole idea of this thing is, is that they will go through their lives categorizing and, and categor, uh, categorizing all of the things that happen to them. In the meantime, the devices are taking readings and looking for things that are happening in your environment and then reporting those. So that was one of the most, the ones that I thought was most interesting. There's another couple that were very, very interesting. This is Another one that we had very, very large microwave signals, very, very large microwave signals where normally this is just, you know, blah, very, very boring. And then they had these very large signals at this exact moment. And then they reported that, you know, everybody, this affected the entire family. Um, there was people that if I recall, there was, there was two people in the house reported migraine level headaches. Uh, one person experienced a severe nosebleed. Uh, they had ringing in the ears all, all the afternoon. Uh, the symptoms persisted until six o'clock the next day. I mean, this was a significant problem for these people. So they they woke up with bad dreams. They got these headaches. There were some, and this is multiple people, and mm. it wasn't just one particular person. And um, and it died out right after that. It died out. It just so happened that these this one of the people um, one, was a high level government employee. He had prior to this called the FBI looking for, um, cause he thought he was very, you know, being very, very paranoid at home. He thought something, somebody was following him. So he actually contacted the FBI. Yeah. After this happened, he contacted NCIS and said, something's going on. I'm being, something's going on out there. So I actually had to produce or create a report for the FBI and NCIS, which is something I've never done before. Um, showing in this like data. they actually believe they were being targeted with some kind of yes, a technology absolutely. like a yeah. like a yeah like you hear these reports of people that come out of special forces or cia and they feel like they have havana syndrome because they did work in russia and things exactly and scared this the whole family was scared um they ended up actually leaving the house they they left they sold the house and left so yeah, that is a uh, that was a very good interview, and I I like the way that that he described it and and some of his anecdotal uh, stories that he that he had with it. Um, you know this this is the kind of device. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. So the Epic Box by Ghost Gear, myself, I designed it. Uh, I had access to some data from the Maripos that someone else has at a haunted location. And I was able to study the data for over a year. And that information that I got from all of that data is what went into the designing of the Epic Box. So that, uh, you know, the, the different, it takes in six different environmental factors that the spirits can manipulate to force that to say yes or force it to say no. Uh, so that that is why it works and it works very well. Uh, just about everyone that owns it has fantastic feedback and I'm thankful for that. I appreciate all of that. But, you know, just to let you all know that this kind of data can be used to help us in the paranormal field develop new tools uh you know that that's one of the the things that i as an engineer look for when i go out and do research uh, i say research investigation for the data that i can use that i can um, understand that the ghost spirits are able to manipulate yeah we say emf we say that all the time uh but what other things can they manipulate? And what this MARPOS device is finding is that they can emit or or somehow create gamma radiation. So I I'm, I'm looking for it, and I and I hope to have it for this video. But 
I saw another interview with Jim where he took his device to a seance and uh, they performed the seance. He had his Murpos device sitting in the middle of the table and he had to stop the seance because when the seance got going, they uh, he recorded high levels of gamma radiation, which were dangerous. And he had to stop it and say, look, you know, we've got some really bad environmental factors going on here we need to stop this and when they stopped the uh that seance the gamma radiation went back to normal so i find that very interesting and dangerous right you know we always talk about how spirits can hurt people over time right that they cause sickness that they can you know it's theorized maybe even they can cause death well looking at this data it's it kind of backs that up, right? Because if they can, and I'm not saying they can, I'm just saying it. there's some correlation uh, with gamma radiation and paranormal activity uh, when it's really strong that, you know, maybe people could be getting hurt that way. And it's very dangerous. You know, what else can they do? We know that uh, positive ions are bad for us. Negative ions are good for us. Right. When we go out to the woods or we go to the beach or we go hiking, you know, we get a lot of negative ions, which make us feel good. It's good for a mood booster. You can buy negative ion generators on Amazon and put them in your bedroom or office. You know, they're just good for you. On the flip side, positive ions are bad for you. Positive ions can cause uh, organ failure. I mean, it, it's that bad. So if these, if spirits can manipulate the environment in such a way to cause that kind of harm, you know, that's the kind of research I would like to see done by investigators, you know, not just running in with an EMF meter, waving it around, but let's go in and start gathering quantitative and qualitative data so that we can do things like, like Jim is doing, uh, you know, over there with a the Marpos device and, and, other research to to help us understand these, I'm going to call them interdimensional beings, but that includes spirits as well, um, you know, what is going on over there. So th that was my introduction to the Murpos device. I wanted to, you know, introduce that to the paranormal community. I know that's probably not uh, a household name, Jim Sagala, but he should be. He's doing a lot of great work. Now, most of his work, though, admittedly, is pointed more towards uh, UFOs and aliens. But that the fact that he's looking at strange phenomena can still be used over into our side of the paranormal, into the ghost hunting and, you know, research that, that we do. So I would like for you all to go and look up Jim Segala. Uh, learn more about him, what he's doing, what he's done, some fantastic stuff. If you've got the money, I would love to see some of these haunted locations have this Murpos device. You know, it's static. You stick it somewhere up in the corner by the ceiling and just let it log data. And you can go in and, you know, look at the data. And when you have guests customers that have rented it out for the night, you know, have them create a log and write down, you know, at 9.05, this happened. And then you can take that information and go back and look and see if there were any anomalies at around the nine o'clock to 9.10 timeframe that might correlate with what they had experienced at around 9.05. I think that kind of information would be uh, fantastic. And I would like to see some reports you know, being generated. Um, I like, I, like I said, I'm an engineer. I'm a dork. I'm a nerd. I like the data. Uh, I just wish we had more of it in the paranormal field. So, moving on to some other devices that I'd like to talk about. Uh, being the first show, I thought I'd, I'd hit all the low hanging fruit, all the popular devices, and the REM pod is one that I, I get a lot of as a get a lot of people ask me you know one when is ghost gear going to come out with a, its own rem pod like device and two i get a lot of questions on how does it work how does a rem pod actually work and that's what i want to talk about is how does a rem pod actually work so a rem pod uses a 555 timer 555 i said that fast 555 timer uh that they've been around forever they're fantastic little integrated circuits and you can set them up in what's called a stable 
uh, A-stable um, circuitry, basically. Um, and, and what it does is it will just flash out, right, frequent, it just pulses, right? It just pulses over and over and over and over again for eternity uh, until it loses power, basically. And you can add an antenna to that. And do that antenna, it's going to pulse. And that's where we say uh, an EMF or a, a REM pod generates EMF. Let's do that 555 timer that's pulsing and it's just pulsing out energy. And then what we can do is we can take that and we can read the frequency at which it is pulsating. And we set that to, a cali we calibrate that, we set that to a normal uh, range and then we monitor it. And if anything, so as it's pulsing, Right. If anything comes in that field and affects that pulsation, that rate at which it's pulsing, then we say something, something's entered the field. Right. So uh, that's where, you know, we call it a proximity sensor because that's what it's doing. It's sensing something in the proximity. And we measure that with some kind of microcontroller that is programmed to look at the frequency. And when that frequency changes, it will throw the alarm and say something's not right. You know, this thing has been operating at 70,000 hertz. Now, all of a sudden, it's for whatever reason and operating at 65,000, uh, something different has happened, so it throws the alarm. Uh, so that's the essential on, on how a REM pod works. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, I don't believe that it's generating EMF because I take my K2 meter and I wave it around the antenna and I don't get any readings. Well, that's because the REM pod is generating EMF at a higher frequency than what the K2 meter can read. If you look at the uh, instructions or specifications on a K2 meter, it will only read up to 20,000 hertz. It reads from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Uh, the reason for that is it was originally designed to find live wires behind the wall. It was made for plumbers and electricians, much like a stud finder finds studs behind drywall, uh, this device will find live wires behind the drywall. And it does that through reading of, of the EMF. And wires in the uh, UK and in the US are 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So that's why this the K2 meter is honed in and designed to, to really be very accurate at 50 to 60 hertz. And then anything outside of that, it's not very accurate at all because it, well, it's designed to read electrical wiring. Uh, so the famous plumbers known as the uh, Ghost Hunters TV show, uh, Grant and Jay Wilson. No, Grant Wilson and Jason Hawes. Man, I got my names all messed up. Uh, you know, they were plumbers. So they use this device as plumbers to find live wires and walls. And as ghost hunters, they thought, well, I bet we could use this since it detects EMF to see if there's a ghost in the area. And that's why they started using it in ghost hunting. And then the TV show took off and then, you know, K2 meters got super popular in, in ghost hunting. Uh, so the REM pod generates around 70 to 100,000 hertz. So it pulses 70,000 to 100,000 times per second. The K2 meter can't read that, it's too high. So you will not get any readings off of your uh, REM pod with a K2 meter. Now, if you have meters out there that are way better than a K2 meter, uh, you might get some readings off of that. Um, some of them go up much higher in the frequencies. Uh, if you have a spectrum analyzer uh, and, you, and you hone in on that, you know, certain frequencies around 100,000 hertz, you will see a spike when you flip on your REM pod. So they do generate EMF. It's a very small field. Uh, that's why you got to get so close to them because of the amount of energy going through the 555 timer is limited. So the more voltage we could put through the 555 timer, the, the bigger the, the radius would get. But I mean, still, again, you're only talking, you know, like nine to 12 volts. Uh, what we would really want, if you wanted to cover a room, you would need like 120 volts, but no 555 timer can take that much voltage. So that's out of the question. Uh, so it is what it is. Uh, that's how, in a nutshell, a REM pod works. So what is it reading? What can change the frequencies of that uh, pulsation from the 555 timer? Well, anything that's going to get in there and affect a 
well, anything that has a frequency, let's just start there. Uh, EMF has a frequency, electromagnetic field. So let's take the walkie-talkies, for instance. They use EMF, radio frequency, to speak to the other walkie. That's how they are linked up and communicate. When you're near a REM pod and you hit your walkie-talkie, the REM pod goes off. Why is that? Well, that's because there is a small EMF field around the REM pod, and then you're introducing another EMF into that field. And then that's going to cause the frequency to change. So you get some harmonics, you get some, you know, addition, subtraction of frequencies, you get uh, what we would uh, uh, call in, you know, in that is, uh, I forget the name of it, when you add two to sine waves together you get a different amplitude and you can also get a different frequency when that frequency changes again the microcontroller senses that and throws the alarm um, so that that's one reason or, or one thing that that can set it off um, other things are emf pumps can set them off I've seen where the little Tesla coils and the plasma balls will set them off. Now, if you turn on, and I've done this, I did this as kind of a joke. I was at a location and they had a REM pod setting out a bed. And then on a little table on the other side of the room, they had one of those plasma balls. The plasma ball was turned on. The REM pod was sitting over there. Nothing was happening. Nothing was happening at all. I, I, I was getting bored. So I, I went over and I touched the, the uh, plasma ball. As soon as I touched the plasma ball, the REM pod went off and everybody's like, oh, you know, activity's starting now. Right. So they started asking questions. And every time they'd ask a question, I would touch that that uh, that plasma ball and the plasma ball would make the the REM pod go off. And I would kept doing that. And they, they were like, you know, thinking that they were interacting with a spirit. And I'm like, how do you not notice? I'm right here in the middle of the room with the rest of you. And whenever I touch this plasma ball, the REM pod goes off, right? So how it worked was the plasma ball is generating EMF, right? When I touched it, my body became an antenna. So the surface of my body, I have a, basically a big area blowing out EMF. And as soon as I touched it, it was enough to reach the REM pod and throw the REM pod off or, you know, force it to alarm on. Uh, so afterwards, I explained to everybody what was going on, that they were not talking with a ghost. And it, it's also a lesson learned, right? So you got you to be careful with that stuff uh, because any other person, they, they may not put two and two together, right? But knowing how the REM pod works will help you identify those false positives. Uh, uh, another thing is capacitance. That's really what the a proximity sensor does is it measures capacitance. Capacitance, let's get the official definition of capacitance. Let me Google this. Capacitance. Capacitance is the capacity of a material charge. So that is what capacitance means. It means that the whatever has entered into the field has the ability to store or transfer uh, electric charges. So like an iron rod, if you weighed an iron rod near a REM pod, you would set it off because that iron rod has the ability to, uh, you know, hold an electric charge. So the one thing, and a lot of people hear me preach on this is I see it time and time again. They put a REM pod on a metal chair or on a metal table or something along those lines where that metal chair and metal table, just like my body became a large antenna when I touched that uh, plasma ball, that chair becomes an extension of the antenna and makes it bigger. Now there's charges in the air, charges all around us. Right. So that chair, that metal chair is going to change its charge as as more positive ones come in and negative ones flow in in the air. That chair is constantly in a state of fluctuation where it's changing its uh, charge. It's, and it's it, because it's made of metal, it, it'll, you know transfer electrons it'll it'll transfer and hold a, a charge and that will set off a rem pod as well um, i was watching uh this this youtube 
video once and uh, they had a REM pod on a wood table, but it was setting at the time. I thought it was setting on a mirror uh, because they had the, the lights off and they had their, their night vision turned on and it looked like it was on a mirror. Uh, but when uh, another scene came through and the lights were on, I realized it was a metal a square piece of, of metal that they had sitting on the table and then they had the REM pod on top of it. And I was like, they know exactly what they're doing uh, with, with that. So that little metal base became an extension of that antenna, which made it super sensitive, right? So, you know, you could practically cough or sneeze and set off that REM pod. Uh, so that that's, you know, knowledge is power, right? So the more you know about your device, how it actually works, the more, or or the better you can use it out in the field because you know that that we as as ghost hunters we uh you know we're fringe right so everyone's looking to disprove anything that we do find so you know my thought is we need to make sure we don't have anything like this that can be used against us so that when we do bring out our investigation results and we take that to the public and say oh my goodness look what we found this is amazing you know we don't it's not sitting on a metal chair or something like that that somebody can you know very quickly debunk or, or say that that's not uh, you know spirit activity the the other thing is uh radio jamming i'd like to talk a little bit about uh with with rem pods i've seen this uh there's a show on uh discovery very popular ghost hunter fella and he had a REM pod and a mel meter setting next to each other on a wood, it was a wooden table, uh, on a wooden table. And I thought, what the hell are they doing, right? So you've got this REM pod, which is generating a small EMF field, and you've got a mel meter, which has a REM pod feature inside of it. So it's generating an EMF field and it reads EMF. So you've got these two devices in close proximity of one another, and there's a thing called radio jamming. Uh, so you've got these things fighting with one another in the same space. Now, in true radio jamming, you can completely block out the signal from being reached to its desired destination. But we're not probably seeing that with two REM pods next to each other. But what we are seeing is them fighting with each other, um, you know, in a space that we can't see what they're doing. But they are. They're constantly in flux with one another because they're, they're going back and forth. Now, in, this, in, in ghost hunting with spirits, we are, we're trying to measure the slightest, the utmost slightest change in the atmosphere that should not be there. And that's what we're trying to measure. So we don't need to do things that hinder our ability to measure these slightest little changes in the atmosphere like sticking two rim pods next to each other um, keep those things apart keep them at least six feet apart from one another uh, because we like i said you're I, I like to use the invisible candle little story what have you uh, so let's say there's an invisible candle in a room your job is to prove there is a candle in the room so what are you going to look for? We're going to look for heat that shouldn't be there. So temperature change because the candle will give off heat. We're going to look for light that shouldn't be there because the candle gives off light. Maybe it's a scented candle. So we're going to look for odors that, that should not be there. Uh, now, the idea is to, one, prove that the candle is there. So it gives off very little light, very, very, very little light. And, and we're in a room and it's daytime and the sun is shining. So how the hell do you find the light that should not be there? It's going to be very, very tiny. It's going to be very hard to find. You might look for shadows, a shadow that shouldn't be there. Why is a shadow on this side instead of that side? Because the sun's over here, not over there. Um, so we got to look for these subtle clues as to uh, you know where the candle might be placed in the room. So if it's in that corner or is it in that corner over there because the shadow's over here, so the light would have to come from over there to create a shadow over there, right? So that those are the very subtle things that we're looking for in, in ghost hunting. And we don't need to hinder ourselves by doing silly things like sticking two REM pods next to each other, right? Or 
uh, a REM pod next to a EMF meter or things like that. You got to understand the technology on what each of your devices are using. Uh, it's okay to put a PIR sensor next to a REM pod. They will not affect one another. That's perfectly fine. Uh, or some of the other devices that you can mix and match are ultrasonic. Ooh, see that? Ultrasonic, PIR, right? They won't affect one another. One deals with light, one deals with sound, right? Uh, the, the REM pod with the PIR. One deals with electromagnetic field, one deals with light, but light is electromagnetic. So, you know, but light is a super high uh, frequency as to compare to what the REM pod is, is working at. So they're probably not going to affect one another. Uh, what we don't want to do is have a laser grid and a PIR sensor. Right. Uh, I, I did run into this where they had a infrared laser grid with for their cameras. And then they also had a device that uses uh, passive infrared and it would it was kind of going off every now and again. And they were like, oh, there's something happening. And I'm like, no, maybe we need to kill one of these infrared sources and, and see if, if that is uh, affecting it. So that that's also another you know, way to debunk is to divide and conquer, right? You got two devices out there, one's going off. You think there's something paranormal going on, turn everything else off and see if that device continues to act the way that it does. Um, so, you know, understand how your devices work, understand what their limitations are. Every No, no device is perfect. Um, and they all have their weaknesses, understand what those weaknesses are and understand the limitations, understand what can, the type of technology that they use as well, right? So we don't, like I said, we don't wanna add two of the same type technology right next to each other because we'll get something like radio jamming happening. Um, so I have babbled on long enough. I, I think this is, the the end for this first episode i hope you found it valuable uh, if you did give it a, a thumbs up a like uh, whatever share it if you can that will indicate to me that there's some value to this and, and you found it valuable and i will continue to work on more episodes and uh, pack them full of, of information as much as i can hopefully i, I don't put you all to sleep with my nerdiness um, <laughs> my, but it is what it is. I, I you know, I, I like it. That's, that's the realm, the world that I live in. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at rob at ghostgeartech.com or on social media as well. Uh, Ghost Gear on Facebook. I stay pretty active there. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me there as well. So again, I want to thank you all for watching. And today is Halloween. 2024. Happy Halloween, and I will catch you next time.